Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. We've all got those parts of our house where the internet just won't go. Well, if you had wall-to-wall Wi-Fi from Xfinity, you could worry less about dead spots. Because with wall-to-wall Wi-Fi from Xfinity, you get... Fast speeds, reliable connection in every room, and power for all your devices, even when everyone's online. That's wall-to-wall Wi-Fi, only on the Xfinity 10G network. Restrictions apply. Not available in all areas. Actual speeds vary. The Boat Race, Grand National, World Snooker Final, and the London Marathon. Every year for the past 40 or so, you've known it's the end of winter, spring has sprung, and summer is on its way. The marathon is a sporting spectacular, part of British society, and more importantly, part of all of our lives. It's also the biggest one-day fundraising event in the world, raising more than £66 million for charity last year alone. So how strange, in this the strangest of times, that it won't be happening in April. It'll be in October instead, when hopefully everything we're currently going through will be a dim and distant memory. I'm John. And I'm Michael, and this is Anything But Footy's Great British Bosses, the podcast where we focus on the key people behind the scenes who make the British sporting world tick. 2020 was supposed to be a big birthday celebration. The London Marathon is 40 this year. But on the 13th of March, organisers had to reveal the race was off. Fortunately, it's been moved to the 4th of October instead. I'm Hugh Brasher and I am the event director of London Marathon Events. Hugh, firstly, a year of celebration was planned, as we mentioned. How difficult has all this been, the ongoing impact of coronavirus? I think that... uh, it's been difficult for everybody just to try and adjust what is going on in in the world. And uh, if you think that on the 31st of December, um, so that is less than three months ago, uh, I think the first case in in Wuhan was was, was found. And where we are today is uh, the world is being affected. Uh, The speed of change is unheralded. And we are uh, in in the UK now um, being asked to to stay in our houses, uh, to exercise once a day only uh, and only go to work if the work we do is essential. So I think it's we're just in such uncharted waters and uh, it's incredibly difficult for everyone, just everyday life and trying to adjust to it. But you are pretty quick in some in some ways of recognizing this and realizing that the London Marathon couldn't go ahead in April? Yeah, I think that uh, we, I think really the penny started to drop for us um, very seriously um, the the night before the big half. And the the big half is the Vitality Big Half. It's a, mm. it's a relatively new event that we organize that is, that, that, that is trying to be uh, uniquely lo- local but truly global. Um, and it's trying to really uh, encourage uh, London's communities to get behind an event and uh, to to open it up to all areas of society. And and that event was on the first of March, and I was sitting in the uh, in in the race hotel, and I got information that the Paris half marathon had been called off at twelve hours notice, and we had been looking at um, at, at the situation before then. But all of a sudden, uh, our realisation of, of, of what was happening in, in the world 
uh, and how quickly things were changing uh, just skyrocketed. And then how easy was it to make the decision to call it off? It sounds like it was the right thing, and obviously it was. Um, but you then had to be able to then find another date for it. And I'm, I can imagine in a city like London, you can't just suddenly go, right, we need the whole of central London uh, closed on a, on a Sunday in October. How, how did that come about? How, how tough a challenge was that? Well, I think it, it came from, first of all, the the realisation that, that, as you said, the London Marathon raises £66.4 million for charity last year. It has become... Um, you know, part of 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 the glow of the heritage, really now of of Britain, um, and uh, to have done that, this was gonna, this was going to be our fortieth race, and to have achieved that in the timescale we have, when you have other events such as the Grand National, the Boat Race, the FA Cup, they're all over a hundred years old, and yet the marathon. This was our fortieth race. But it, it, it really has progressed from 1981, where it was predominantly men taking part and, and they were all runners, to a sea of humanity coming together and, and something that is, is so important. Um, it is uh, showing that mankind can work together. The community of mankind can come together and celebrate together. And that was one of my father and John Disley's uh, founding pillars of the event um, from when they went to, to New York in, in 1979. And I think with that realisation, we, we understood that, that uh, we had to try and find another date. And we spoke immediately to the mayor's office, to TfL, to the Royal Parks, and everybody was incredibly supportive um, because I believe they understand what the marathon means to London, what it means to Britain, what it means to charities, what it does in inspiring people to take up activity and something that's been seen to be so good for your physical and mental health. And, and at the moment with what's going on in the world, people's mental health and trying to get some exercise is so important. So our stakeholders were just uh, so helpful um, and we did some work on uh, sort of daylight hours. We did it on temperatures. We looked at other major things going on in London. And pretty well, there were two dates. And that two dates came down to one, which was the 4th of October. And we were able to announce that when, when we made the decision. Um, and uh, it, it uh, is something we hope that uh, we and the world can look forward to as you say, as, as uh, a light at the end of the tunnel when, when we're coming out of uh, what the world is dealing with at the moment. Yeah, you mentioned your dad, uh, Chris, and also John Disley, and I'll, I'll come back to them in a moment. Just one more question on the whole coronavirus um, before we move on. I remember the Boston bombing just weeks before the London Marathon a, a few years ago and, and, and the implications it had on London then. But coronavirus, this must have been yours and the marathon's biggest challenge to date yeah i think it's uh you know in in my lifetime it's 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 the world's biggest challenge i think yeah. and um yeah. and uh yeah the the atrocity of boston as 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 you said and how london taking place six days days later again it showed um our ties with america at that stage um and the London Marathon is part of a, the, the six major marathons in the world, the Abbott World Marathon Majors, and there, there was so much support going on amongst each of the race directors in, in the conversations we were having about our own events. Uh, Tom Grilk, who is uh, uh, my sort of equivalent at the Boston Athletic Association, um, it's probably doing me uh, upping my uh, importance over Tom, but uh, um, he he and I were speaking daily at all times of the night, really um, day and night, just coordinating, trying to understand what each of us were going through, what the cities were going through, what the mayors were going through. Um, so that support uh, was 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 really helpful at the time, um, uh, and and as you say, it 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 really it was a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge dealing now with all our staff working remotely communicating in 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 new ways that 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 uh, that actually could in the long term be really beneficial but at at the moment it is a time of um of reflection and a time of um just trying to make sure we communicate with each other 
and support each other through through these t- th- through what is going on in the world. You mentioned there your staff. The London Marathon is so much more than just the race in April, as you've mentioned, and so much more than your dad, Chris, and, and John Disley would have imagined in, in 1981. How many staff do you have, Hugh, and, and how tough is it has been to, to, to get them all working uh, remotely? So we have a team of about 75 staff uh, at the moment, and they are incredibly committed to to inspiring activity that is the vision of london marathon events inspiring activity and uh and and all our profit goes to the london marathon charitable trust uh they have about another eight staff working for them and uh their vision is also inspiring activity and it it, it's actually we are uh we really have a social purpose of of uh, as an organization we're a social enterprise in a way um, and that purpose, as I say, is is to try and, and inspire activity in all ages, all demographics and all abilities. And it goes past just the London Marathon. It's Ride London, which is the largest uh, Prudential Ride London, the largest cycling festival in the world. The Vitality uh, Big Half and the Vitality Westminster Mile and London 10,000. Uh, Standard Charter Great City Race, Swim Serpentine. We have, uh, I think it's 14 different mass participation events during the year two professional cycling races and uh, uh, we're involved in the Daily Mile. Um, we are, you know, we help fund uh, things like park runs. So there are so many areas of, of uh, running, swimming and cycling that we're involved in. And those events are the most popular in, in, in Britain. They're three of the most popular events that pe- people take part in regular activity. And um, yeah, the staff have just been uh, agile in their thinking uh, and uh, really have been supporting each other. Well, we wish them and you, of course, all the, all the best over the coming weeks. The legacy of the marathon, you took over. it. Your, your dad famously set it up, as we've said. Um, how much of a privilege is it that you're now following in his footsteps? I think it's an enormous privilege to, to do any job that you love. Um, and uh, to work with a team, um, to have a goal that, that fundamentally is about trying to help change society for good. Uh, sport should be for everyone. Uh, there are so many issues that uh, society has in terms of um, health and obesity. We have nearly 40% of 9 to 10-year-olds overweight or obese. Um, we have... Uh, 80% of 40 to 60-year-olds in danger of getting type 2 diabetes. And the more that we can just get people more active, the, the, the better it can be. And, and we are passionate as a team about trying to inspire that activity through both our events and through what the Trust is doing in, in helping other organisations build infrastructure um, that support people doing activity and, and sport. So, um, it's an, yeah, it's an, it's an enormous privilege. You get up every day and uh, it, it, it really isn't uh, difficult to do in any way. It's that the team are incredible and the values of the organisation that, 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 that we have and, and how committed we are to this, this greater social purpose um, is, is, is just so motivating. So the first event was held in 1981 and 6,000, more than 6,000 people finished uh, in that year. Now more than 30,000 finish and it's been going and this would have been the 40th. So in October, it will be the 40th race. So the kind of birthday celebrations are beginning. You've got a couple of years of those, really. Yeah, I mean, it's actually 40, I think it was uh, 43,000 or 42,500 finished last year. Uh, Wow. So... um, uh, and we've now raised over £1 billion for good causes. Our runners have raised over £1 billion for good causes since since 1981. We had uh, just the most incredible field of elite athletes ever. Um, Elliot Kipchoge, the, the men's world record holder, the man that, that 
beat the two hour um, broke the two hour barrier for the for, for for the marathon in Vienna in October, uh, running against Kenanisa Bakila, um, who's who holds um, the second fastest time ever, only two seconds slower than than Elliot, who has actually beaten Elliot on the track more times than Elliot has beaten him. Uh, their head to head performance was incredible. Bridget Koskai, who beat Paula Radcliffe's world record from 2003 um, that she did in Chicago the day after Iliad. She was coming to run. Uh, we had Manuela Shah, uh, the uh, uh, Paralympic wheelchair athlete, who is also the world record holder. Um, Ernst van Dijk, um, Daniel Romanchek in, in the men's wheelchair event. I mean, uh, world record holders in, in every uh, uh, able-bodied and, and wheelchair um, event uh, and that's the first time we believe it's ever happened in the history of the marathon in, in one event together so mm. yeah it was it it uh, was going to be an incredible day on the 26th of April and we really hope that we can we can build and 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 as as the world comes through we hope what is uh, this this pandemic that the 4th of October can bring a bigger celebration and and once again show uh help show what the world can do together um because community spirit is what is needed more than ever in in our everyday lives and that's what the marathon has shown throughout the previous 39 races you're listening to great british bosses from anything but footy this is the podcast where we focus on the key people behind the scenes those that make the british sporting world tick we're with the race director of london marathon limited Hugh Brasher. You were 16 when the first marathon was held. What, what's your memories of that day? Um, and, and are they still your favourite memories of the of the race, kind of 40 on? Oh, my memories of the day was I was fast asleep, actually. Um, <laughs> so I, I, um, I had sold, um, yeah, I'd sold uh, all the train tickets. So it, it was the 29th of March. I think it was Easter holidays. I was off school. Um, and uh, I, I was paid, um, I think it was the princely sum of £3 a day to sell the train tickets, so that was 6,300 train tickets at 50p each. So I was in the, in, in the Strand Palace Hotel working, uh, I think it was 12 hours a day for £3, and uh, at the end of those three days, uh, at that age, I, I think I, I, I just had no idea what was going on. Uh, I slept, and, and I think that the realisation really of what had happened um, was was only on the Monday morning, and and that was when uh, 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 the Daily Mail uh, opened. Well, I didn't open it. Was on the front page, and you saw Dick Beardsley and Inga, Inga Simonson hand in hand on the front page of the Mail. And I sort of, you know, well, that's what my father had been going on about, and this is, the, and that's what I was selling the train tickets for. But really, it, it you know, you didn't really understand it, and I think. I'm not sure that that John or my father really realised then what they were creating, um, and sadly they've both, they've both passed away. But the legacy that they they have left with this event is is something that is is genuinely incredible. Um, and uh, is, is it true? Is it true? You considered remortgaging the house to stage it? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my mother stopped him doing that. Uh, they, they had no headline sponsor. And um, uh, then at the last minute, uh, I think it was Gillette, um, uh, stepped in and, and, and the first sponsorship, I believe, was £50,000. So, so, yeah, that's, that's what he was going to do. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think the two of them were just so determined, John and my father, to, to get the event to, to happen. And they'd been to New York in, in 79 and got in, inspired. And it's incredible to think that, that from, from nothing to the first event was, um, was, was just under 18 months. So, so it really was quite incredible. Is it slightly frustrating on a sporting perspective, Hugh, that it was set up to try and help British marathon runners uh, compete and, and, and achieve? And, I mean, I remember, obviously, Paula Radcliffe that you mentioned, but Eamon Martin uh, winning as well. Um, but Mo Farah has obviously had, a, had attempts in, in the last few years or so. But there hasn't been that kind of British... Uh, runners coming through as as much as maybe when you when it when it started off that that was the purpose of it i think i mean frustration i think it's a great challenge i think um but i think also you need to uh, something that i'm not sure is as well publicized is is that um four of the fastest 
10 British female marathon runners were going to be competing on the 26th of April. So British women's marathon running has never been as strong as it is now. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, we have Callum Hawkins, who's come fourth um, in the World ch- Championships in Doha, quite incredible performance. And we helped support Mo Farah um, from winning the mini marathon three times through his university education, um, through all the time um, before he was elite athlete, London Marathon events has uh, helped support him. And, and there are so many other um, athletes that we have. The Brownlee um, uh, brothers did, did the mini marathon. David, uh, David Weir did it. Um, so uh, I, I really believe that, um, you know, there is a possible future where once again, Britain can become the powerhouse of endurance running. Uh, that is a vision that that, that uh, we're talking to British Athletics about. It's something that, that we would love uh, to help uh, happen. And, and the marathon, as I say, is about inspiring activity. And the more you build the base of people doing it, the more you get kids excited uh, by the sport. Um, and, and what Elliot Kipchoge did in Vienna in October has inspired people. Um, and uh, that's really what, what motivates us. Wouldn't it be great if he could come and and do it in London and set the world? I mean, obviously, set the world record officially, if you like, because obviously it was a, it was that um, kind of planned uh, marathon record that it, that he broke. Um, it's not been ratified in in terms of like when Paula Radcliffe uh, broke hers famously in the uh, in the early noughties. Is that something you're you're talking to Elliot about? Well, I think if you just go to to no, it wasn't ratified as a world record because he wasn't racing other people. Had to be racing three other uh, two other athletes. Had to be three people in the race, and the pacemakers were um, were rotating. And he was handled, handed his, uh, his drinks bottle. But if you go back in, in history um, and, and you go to the four-minute mile, and my father was the pacemaker to Sir Roger yes. Bannister, and they had numerous attempts of, um, of different arts of pacemaking. There was one at Motspur Park where my father, I believe, did the first two laps. He then almost jogged on the spot for the third lap. Um, uh, ran flat out for the fourth to uh, to help Roger, and and I think it was then a British record. It missed the um, it missed the world record, it missed going under four minutes. But then um, uh, the authorities decided to ban that action. So I think um, you know that there have been times where you look to technology, and that's really what 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 Vienna did. We were London Marathon events were the. Um, uh, we were the operational team that delivered that event in Vienna with the Vienna City Marathon team. And it, it was a fascinating project to be part of. Uh, and what Elliot achieved and how he achieved it um, is quite incredible. If you saw people trying to cycle um, and the speed they were having to go to keep up with him. Um, and and if you just try and go to a, a local athletic track, this is a challenge for your listeners, Go to an athletic track and run round it as fast as you can and time it and see how many of you can get under 66 seconds. Um, I doubt it will be more than five in every hundred of your your listeners. Um, And that's doing one lap. Um, And Elliot did 108 of those back to back with not a single bit of recovery. Um, So look, he's an amazing athlete. He is a... uh, lovely humble man uh with some amazing values um and i think his race against kenanisa if it happens um in october will be fascinating and we just really look forward uh to, to that uh, possibility you mentioned some of the events earlier other events earlier ride london uh, the swimming in in, in serpentine as, as well um is it revolution or evolution uh, for for your business, you know the constant need to improve and and come up with new events. Ah, I think uh, it's interesting. I think it's uh, it's evolution, um, but every now and again you probably have to have a revolution. Uh, so I think the first time that we did cycling, that really was a revolution for London Marathon events. First time going outside um, uh, what 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 the company had been involved in then, which purely was running. Um, but now it's much more about evolution uh, and, uh, um, you know, developing the team, developing what we can do. But you've always got to be open to change because the world is changing so rapidly around us. So a bit of both. But I, I generally 
um, uh, we would say you probably need five or six years of, of evolution and, and then possibly a revolution every now and again. So there might be a new event coming up that we don't know about yet that you, you've got your eyes on? We, we, we have our eyes on, on something that we hope will be incredibly in, inspiring and we're looking at trying to do it for 2022. We, we do look quite a long way ahead um, and uh, we're working on a whole digital transformation project and how we can inspire people in, in, in a manner that works for them and, and really engage them in a way that is, is, is unique. And that's the great thing about events um, is the connection that you get with the participant, um, the conversations you have over a period of time as they, as they train for the, for the event and, and how you can introduce them to, to, to other events. We have a database of over one and a half million people, yet we can only fit about 250,000 people in our events in any one year. So, you know, we have a responsibility to, to, to the people to try and... Um, to try and to our customers to try and 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 uh, inspire them to do other events and and open up those avenues. So I think, you know, the industry uh, at the moment as well, the mass participation industry is really looking at sustainability, and we're really trying to work together as an industry and uh, do that, especially in 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 these times. You mentioned the challenge earlier of uh, of, of various um, parts of the business. One of them is the popularity of London Marathon. The subscription, the continued oversubscription to try and get into the race. My colleague Michael has applied ten times and never been successful. Um, is that is that disappointing in some ways that people don't always get the opportunity when they really want to do it? It's it's a, again an interesting question, and and uh, you talk about disappointment. I think it we it's a very uh, interesting balance that we have to play between all the different facets of of the event. So, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with uh, all areas of aspects of society in terms of people that can run quickly and people that have never, never run a marathon before, and also in terms of inspiring people to raise money for good causes, and 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 also trying to help clubs clubs to run and, and encouraging people to to experience what it is like to be part of a running club. So we have so many different um, areas of the entry system, international entrance, what we can do to um, help Britain's economy. Over £130 million is the economic benefit to to um, the event taking place. So, yeah, there's a myriad of different uh, uh, sort of areas that, that we're, we're dealing with. And, and Hopefully we have the balance right. Uh, I think you can always, uh, you know, say, well, let's do more, try and do more of these. Um, but I think you have to be careful. You, you know, marathon runners, it, it's not something that you, you should be doing every day. It's not something you should be doing every week. Um, we would say that, that two a year is, is probably about right. Um, and, and having it such a amazing experience where it's the crowd that, that, that really make it such an amazing event three course million people lining the course and and cheering you on this amazing sea of positivity where where uh, by the end of those 26.2 miles if you've put your name on the front of your t-shirt or your running vest you probably wish you'd had your name you, you know you wanted a name change because you've heard it so often <laughs> so yeah it's 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 just this it really is an emotional experience um, running the marathon. And, and, and uh, you know, I would just say run run for charity. There are so many causes that need money and, and running 26.2 miles is not easy. Um, so that that's why I think, you know, for some people getting in the ballot, um, it is great and, and they try every year. Um, but on, on the other hand, if you really want to do it, then then please um, do do it for charity. They They need that money, especially now, um, with what's going on um, in the world at the moment. A really good tip. Thank you for that. You brought us very nicely to the end. My final question, you talked about the magicalness of the the route and the millions or three quarters of a million uh, spectators. Will it still have that magic in October, Hugh? I, I believe that magic will uh, be there like never before. Um, I really hope that the world is uh put covid19 uh behind it i hope that 
scientists. I hope that uh, governments, uh, I hope the society has has really come together and and that on October the 4th is, is what we want to show. Uh, we want to show the human endeavour um, and we want to show that community spirit. So I absolutely believe on the 4th of October it will be uh, the 40th race like no other. Well, Hugh Pressure, thank you so much for talking to great British bosses from anything but footy. We really appreciate it. And we have been practising social distancing. We haven't done it in person. We haven't. Absolutely. I'm uh, looking out in in my garden and uh, relaxing. And uh, thank you very much for the conversation. Sports Social Podcast Network. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, We've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.